Welcome everyone to this webinar of the Linguistic Society of America. Today we have the next installment in our Meet the Author series in which we feature authors whose articles have been published in the most recent issue of the journal Language. Today we are pleased to welcome Dr. Lacey Wade, who will present her talk on her paper, Experimental Evidence for Expectation-Driven Linguistic Convergence. In this 90-minute webinar, our presenter will give a presentation for about an hour, after which we will have a period of questions and answers for half an hour, and you can submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the questions uh, form box on your control panel on your screen. So without any further ado, I'll turn this webinar over to Dr. Wade. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so um, I'm just gonna jump right in um, and talk about uh, this paper that just came out in language. Um, so this is the first publication that's coming out of this sort of much bigger project that was my dissertation work. Uh, so I'm going to start today by uh, sort of situating this work within some of the broader themes of my research more generally. Uh, so I'll start here with a very broad and perhaps uh, obvious statement, and I'll say that language is full of variation. And this variation isn't random, uh, language patterns in predictable ways along social dimensions. So social factors like where we're from, who we hang out with, or who we want to hang out with, uh, all influence the way we use language. Uh, this also includes more uh, sort of temporary or situation specific factors, things like how we feel, uh, where we are, and who we're talking to. And people know things about this patterning. Uh, we know things, or sometimes we think we know things, about linguistic features and the people who use them. And, and this, this type of sociolinguistic knowledge influences our own linguistic behavior as well. Uh, so, so beliefs about a talker can influence the way we perceive and categorize their speech. Uh, work on sociolinguistic perception has shown uh, over and over that the same exact speech sound is categorized differently depending on what participants uh, believe or are told about the talker. So things like where the talker is from, their age, gender, race. But we know much less about how sociolinguistic knowledge and how our, our expectations about others influence our own language production. Uh, so this is something that I think is important because it has uh, even sort of wider implications across linguistics. Uh, I mean, we wanna know about how all sorts of different pressures shape the way we speak. And so uh, understanding how expectations shape our own production is important. Uh, it might tell us things about how language changes, and it can also shed light on things like the relationship between linguistic perception and production. Uh, so this is the, the main question that I'm gonna focus on today. This is the, the main question behind my uh, recent paper. Uh, so how do our expectations about other people and the way they speak influence our own speech production? Uh, and, and in order to answer this question, I'm going to look at the phenomenon of uh, linguistic convergence. So we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, what that is. Um, so I'll just start quickly here with a sort of roadmap about uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, first, I'll start with some background on linguistic convergence and introduce the, um, the variables and the language variety that I'm going to, uh, going to be talking about today. Uh, then I'll talk about two experiments that use a, a new word naming game paradigm to elicit convergence toward expectations. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, two experiments. Experiment one tests how suitable this paradigm is uh, sort of methodologically. And experiment two uh, replicates experiment one and then also adds this investigation into individual differences in convergence behaviors. Uh, and then finally, we'll wrap up with um, some conclusions, what, what these results mean for uh, sort of our theories of convergence and sociolinguistic cognition. 
So let's start with some background. So as I mentioned, uh, this paper focuses on linguistic convergence, which is uh, basically when people sort of temporarily shift their, their language to become more similar to their interlocutors, whoever they're speaking with. And we have a lot of evidence that people do this, that people converge toward things that they have observed in the moment. So uh, speakers shift their speech to imitate the lexical forms of their conversational partners. Uh, they mirror syntactic constructions and they're more likely to use, um, say, an active versus a passive construction based on what they recently heard. Uh, and there's quite a lot of work showing convergence toward phonetic features, such as length and VOT and vowel quality. Um, so there's, there's sort of a lot of work on this. This is just a small sampling of the, uh, the many experimental studies on linguistic convergence to observed behavior. Uh, but it's also been suggested that people converge toward linguistic behaviors that they only expect even if they don't directly observe them from their interlocutor. So uh, we can refer to the identity projection model, for instance, which suggests that people converge toward this sort of stereotype of the model receiver uh, rather than the actual partner that they're communicating with. So um, some evidence for this uh, comes from um, Alan Bell's work in New Zealand. Uh, and uh, he observed that that um, an interviewer produced this A tag more frequently when conversing with a Maori interviewee, because this is sort of a stereotypical feature of male Maori speech, even though this particular interlocutor rarely actually used that tag. Um, so, so the idea here is that people can sort of converge toward the expected behavior um, of, of whoever they're speaking with without actually observing it. Uh, however, I'll note that um, this uh, sort of convergence toward expectations hasn't uh, previously been observed in uh, a sort of controlled laboratory setting. Most of our um, sort of evidence for this is uh, more anecdotal. So uh, in the paper that I'm talking about, uh, I propose this sort of distinction between these two different types of convergence and uh, input-driven convergence and expectation-driven convergence is what I call them. And uh, the main sort of difference uh, between these two types of convergence is in the relationship between the, the trigger of convergence, the thing that initiates convergence, and the, the target, what, what people aim to produce. So for input-driven convergence, uh, the idea is that the trigger of convergence and the target are the same. Um, and the target is sort of directly derived from the input in real time. So this would be like, I might hear the word pancake with length and VOT on P, and then I might go on to produce the word pancake with length and VOT on P. Uh, Expectation-driven convergence, on the other hand, can have um, sort of a wider range of things that can trigger or cue convergence in the first place. Um, so the trigger can be linguistic, but doesn't have to be. And so the target uh, is derived from this sort of pre-existing knowledge that people um, uh, had uh, before this interaction. So um, this might be something like um, I'm talking with somebody, I see something or notice something that makes me think that they are um, Southern, and then I might go on to produce something like y'all because I associate this with Southern speech, even if my conversational partner never actually uses that term. Uh, so, so we can think of these not necessarily as two discrete categories of convergence necessarily, but, but uh, instead we can sort of think of them as two ends on a continuum with uh, sort of varying degrees of generalization from the trigger to the target in between. So, um, for instance, after hearing pancake with length and VOT on P, I might converge by producing uh, a different word, poodle, with length and VOT on P. Or I could generalize even further and produce a kite with length and VOT on K. Um, and we can see how, how um, uh, we can generalize sort of further and further um, between the trigger and the target. Um, so it's expectation-driven convergence that I'm going to be focus on, focusing on today, 
And um, the uh, language variety that I'm going to be looking at is um, Southern US speech. So um, since this is sort of uh, an initial investigation of these, uh, the way expectations influence um, production behavior, uh, it makes sense, I think, to start with a, a very salient and stereotyped uh, variant in a well-recognized variety. Um, and so I'm looking at monofungal eye. I think it, uh, that does exactly that. It's sort of the stereotypical feature associated with uh, southernness. Um, as Paul Reed notes, uh, monofungization is a uh, linguistic caricature, a noteworthy feature in virtually every depiction of Southern speech. Uh, Bill Lebeau calls it the most generally recognized feature of Southern speech. Um, so I'd say it's something people probably know a little something about. And here's what that sounds like. They laugh at me. I took an ice chest out of the wedding and I said, I brought the ice. And these three guys said, you brought the what? And I said, I have. I brought the ice and they said, well, we're not quite sure what, what you're saying. And I opened up this ice chest and I said, see, ice, ice hole. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's an example of what um, eye monofungization, sometimes called glide weakening, uh, sounds like. So uh, basically this is when the glide of the eye vowel is produced uh, sort of lower and backer in the vowel space. And um, in the U.S. South, this occurs in um, coda position or before uh, voiced segments throughout the South. So like word, word finally or before um, voiced segments. And um, we also see this pop up in, in some other environments like before voiceless segments among certain speakers like in the inland South or among working class speakers. Um, we saw, you know, our speaker in the video that we just saw um, said uh, ass, so it's before a voiceless consonant. Uh, but today we're going to focus on uh, coda and pre-voiced realizations because this is where monophthongization pretty reliably occurs in the South. And uh, I'm going to measure um, uh, monophthongization or glide weakening uh, as the realization of the glide um, along this sort of front diagonal um, as F2 minus 2 times F1 at 80% of the way into the vowel. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at in both experiments one, uh, one and two. So we're gonna go ahead and jump, uh, jump right into experiment one here. So experiment one asks essentially whether expectation-driven convergence actually occurs in the first place. So do people converge toward a linguistic form that they might reasonably expect, but they never actually observe from a talker? So more specifically, we're going to ask whether people produce more monophthongal I, uh, which again is this very salient feature of Southern US speech. Um, if they produce this more when they're exposed to a Southern accented talker, who never actually produces any instances of this vowel. So do people produce this based on expectations alone? Um, so before we uh, talk about the, the methods of this experiment, I just wanna start by saying that uh, part of the reason that we've never really observed expectation-driven convergence in um, you know, like a controlled experimental study like this um, is because uh, existing experimental methods focus on convergence toward observed behavior. So things like uh, shadowing tasks where people repeat after a model talker, or um, people have used more cooperative tasks where people sort of engage in less structured conversation. Uh, but the problem with these for getting at expectation-driven convergence is that we can't um, control them very well so that participants never actually observe the feature that we're interested in. And so this means that there's a whole set of questions about convergence towards things that, uh, that aren't in the input um, that we're not really able to answer within existing experimental paradigms. So uh, 
to get at this question, I needed to create a new task. I needed something that would allow me to do a couple things, to um, elicit specific tokens of interest without the conversational partner ever producing them, um, but still uh, sort of providing opportunities for interaction with the conversational partner. Uh, so, so I developed this new task, I call it the word naming game task, and the uh, idea here is that participants are given clues that describe a specific word that I want them to say, and then they name the word out loud in the phrase, the word is blank. And so um, it, the, the sort of game-like nature of this task um, is useful because it takes participants' focus off of their own speech. Uh, so, so we'll talk about uh, sort of the details of this word naming game. The task consists of three phases that vary in the way that the clues are presented. So we have the baseline phase, the exposure phase, and the post-exposure phase. And I'll talk about what each of these are. So in the baseline phase, uh, clues are given to participants on screen and participants silently read the clue to themselves. I'll give you a second, you can read this clue to yourself. And then they would respond out loud, the word is dime. And then their speech is recorded so we can collect their uh, baseline productions before any exposure. Then in the exposure phase, clues are given by either a Midland accented talker, which is our control condition, or a Southern accented talker. Uh, so in this first experiment here, experiment one, um, the two talkers that we're using, the Midland and the Southern talker, they're both uh, white men in their 30s. Um, the Midland talker is from Eastern Ohio and the Southern talker is from uh, Western North Carolina. And um, so uh, they give these clues out loud and participants hear these. And very importantly, these clues never contain any instances of the I vowel. So um, the clues are designed that way to contain no tokens of I whatsoever. So uh, we know that if people converge toward the Southern talker by producing more monoclonal I, it will be, uh, because they expected monofungal eye, not because they actually observed it. Uh, so the clues that participants hear were um, roughly one to two sentences long, and they contained uh, plenty of evidence for the talker's dialect, so people could tell that this was a Southern or um, a Midland accented talker. Uh, so people would hear a clue, and here's what those talkers sound like. This is an alcoholic beverage, usually made from fermented grapes. So that was our Midland accented talker, if you couldn't tell. This is an alcoholic beverage, usually made from fermented grapes. And that was our Southern talker. And then people would respond out loud, something like the word is spider. And then uh, finally, I include this post exposure condition. So um, we're back to clues being written on the screen. So something like um, we see written here, um, this is a four-letter verb that refers to the action you do with a roller coaster, a car, or a horse. So they uh, read a clue like this and then respond out loud, the word is ride. So uh, the words that we try to get participants to say, um, in experiment one, we have 20 target words and 20 fillers in each of these phases. Uh, but we'll change this up a bit and add, add some more in experiment two. Uh, so, so here we see these, um, uh, we have these three lists of words. One of them is elicited in each phase. And these three different lists are balanced for um, things like lexical frequency, and they're roughly, roughly balanced for adjacent segments. And the phase, baseline exposure or post-exposure, uh, that each list appears in is counterbalanced across participants. So some people see list one first, and then some see list three first, and some see list two first. And um, within each of these sets, um, all of the words are randomized uh, for each participant as well. 
So in our first experiment here, uh, the data that we're going to be looking at come from 79 participants who were randomly assigned to one of two conditions, the Southern voice or the Midland voice. Uh, so roughly half are from the U.S. South. That's this sort of shaded uh, region on the map here, which is basically just the isogloss where eye monophthongization occurs. And uh, half are from outside of the, um, the U.S. South. So still from the U.S., but just outside of the South. And um, that's, that's basically just determined by where speakers spent um, the majority of their school-aged years, so ages 5 through 18. Um, this first experiment was administered in person, and um, I did look at um, some other demographic information like age, gender, race, and education, um, but uh, it didn't really tr contribute to convergence rates, so I'm not going to talk about it here. Okay, so let's jump into the results. Um, I'll orient you to the graph first. So um, on the, the x-axis here, we have our three experimental phases. We have the baseline the exposure and the post-exposure. And uh, on the y-axis is our measure of glide weakening. So uh, higher is a stronger glide and lower is a weaker or more southern-like glide. And um, all of the significant stars I'll show you come from uh, mixed effects modeling with the formula down at the bottom. So in the Midland condition, so again, this is the control condition where people hear a Midland accented talker, uh, we see that people shift very little from their baselines. Um, their, their sort of average production of the eye glide is very stable across the baseline exposure and post-exposure phases. Um, so people aren't really shifting their speech much at all uh, throughout the course of the experiment when they hear this Midland accented talker. But when they hear our southern accented talker, they shift from their baselines and they start to produce weaker eye glides or more southern like eye glides during the exposure phase. And then in the post exposure, once they stop hearing our southern talker, uh, they shift, they start to shift back up toward their original baseline productions. So this means that people produce more uh, monophthongal or southern-like eye vowels when they are simply exposed to a southern accented talker, even though that talker never actually produced any instances of the eye vowel. Um, so this is really cool. And we also know that this shift is uh, truly in response to the southern uh, model talker, not just um, a result of sort of general shifts in speech as the experiment progresses. Uh, again, because we see no such shifts for people who heard our Midland accented talker. And we see this difference between the Midland accented condition and the Southern accented condition. So um, people do exhibit expectation driven convergence. Uh, so now we might wonder whether uh, Southern participants and non-Southern participants behave um, similar to one another or differently. So we have our non-Southerners in the top two facets and Southerners in the bottom two. And uh, we see that both groups behave pretty much the same when they hear the Midland accented talker. Both groups shift very little. Uh, the only difference we see is that Southerners have weaker eye glides to begin with. Um, and this is just because we happen to have quite a few already Southern shifted participants in this group. But overall, both groups look very much the same. They're shifting very little, very, very stable um, across the Midland condition. But when they hear the Southern accented talker, um, we see that it's mostly Southerners who shift. Um, Non-Southerners do shift in the expected direction, but the shift is very small. Um, so it's mostly Southerners driving this effect. And this difference between the two groups, Southerners and non-Southerners, is significant as well. So this is really neat. People do converge toward expectations. So uh, now we're going to take a look at what we find in experiment two to see if this, uh, if this result sort of holds up under some slightly different conditions. 
Uh, so, uh, so right, experiment two, we want to know if we can replicate experiment one with some, some minor changes, um, new model talkers and a different subject pool um, participating online so we can gather um, a lot more data uh, more quickly. Uh, but I also want to use this larger scale replication to ask about individual differences. So uh, basically, do we see that some people are more likely to converge than others? And can we pinpoint some explanations for why that might be? So experiment two has essentially the same design as experiment one, but um, a couple of changes. And I'll highlight what, what each of these changes are here. So the most important thing is that we're getting more data um, more participants and more tokens per participant. Uh, and this is important because this will also allow me to do some more robust statistical modeling than what um, I was able to do in experiment one. Um, I also change up the model talkers. Um, so instead of the two white men in their 30s um, to two uh, white women in their 20s, um, the Midland talkers are from the same place in Eastern Ohio, but the Southern talkers differ. So um, like I mentioned in experiment one, our talker was from Western North Carolina, but in experiment two, our talker is from Southern Mississippi. This word refers to an eight-legged arachnid. So that's our Midland talker. This word refers to an eight-legged arachnid. And our Southern talker. Um, the participants were also different. So in experiment one, these were mostly undergraduate students at Penn or at North Carolina State. Uh, but in experiment two, I use prolific to recruit participants. And um, so since these aren't just college students, uh, we have a, a wider range of ages and regional backgrounds um, than, than we had in experiment one. And finally, since the goal was to recruit more participants and get more data, um, we moved this experiment online, which made data collection um, quite a bit quicker. So uh, the data for experiment two come from 112 participants who um, were again randomly assigned to one of our two conditions. Uh, roughly half were from the US South and half were from the US outside of the South. And um, participants, they participated online. And in order to do this, I used um, PC IBEX, uh, which is a really great experimental design toolkit from Penn that I encourage you to check out if you um, do experimental work and, and um, aren't familiar with it. So the word naming game design was the same except there were more tokens elicited in each phase, so 30 instead of 20, uh, for a total of uh, 90 target items um, total. And after participants um, go through the baseline phase and then the exposure phase and then the post-exposure phase, I add a few surveys at the end. Um, so the point of including these surveys was to try to uh, quantify individual differences that might contribute to uh, people's tendency to converge more or less. Um, so, so the idea behind this is sort of that, that all else being equal, uh, some people simply tend to converge more and others converge less or maybe not at all or maybe they diverge. Um, and, and so the idea is that uh, different personality traits or cognitive styles might partially predict these differences. Um, so we're looking at these sort of uh, domain general measures, but um, uh, we think they might correlate with different um, sort of language specific tendencies. So they might predict different uh, convergence behaviors. And previous work has found this, found that uh, certain traits that are, that are measured by these, these self-assessed surveys, um, they do predict a uh, degree of convergence. So um, things like the tendency to misrepresent yourself for social approval, which is measured by the Marlowe-Crown Social Desirability Scale, 
or uh, the tendency to focus on one thing rather than switching attention between multiple things, which is measured um, one of the subscores of the AQ. Um, but these, these past studies um, have looked at individual differences with regard to input-driven convergence, so convergence to uh, what people actually observe in the moment. Uh, but, but my goal here is to test the, the sort of replicability of some of these previous findings with expectation-driven convergence specifically. So uh, I look at the big five inventory of personality traits, um, the autism spectrum quotient, um, which has been used on um, uh, neurotypical populations as a measure of cognitive processing style, um, the Marlowe Crown Social Desirability Scale, which again um, measures how much a person uh, misrepresents themselves for social approval. Um, and I also include a couple of other survey measures, um, questions measuring things like attitude toward the model talker, attitudes toward the self, um, familiarity with the self, um, since um, we've also seen that positive attitudes have been shown to um, uh, predict more convergence as well. Um, so basically, I, I'm just trying to see if we can pinpoint uh, why some people are more likely to converge besides what we've already seen where Southerners converge more. Um, and the idea is that this might shed light on, on what sort of skills or, or tendencies people are using when they converge and, um, and here specifically when they converge toward expectations. Okay, so let's see the results. Uh, the graphs are laid out the same way as in experiment one. Um, and again, the significant stars come from mixed effects modeling. Um, the formula's on the bottom, but I'll just note that with the big increase in data, I'm able to include um, all the random slopes that significantly improve model fit. So um, the models are a bit more complex. So in the left facet, uh, again, when people hear the Midland accented talker, they, uh, again, shift very little across phases. But when they hear our Southern talker, uh, participants make this big shift from their baseline to produce a, uh, a weaker eye glide in the exposure phase. And then in the post-exposure phase, they shift back up toward their baseline. So this looks um, pretty much like what we saw in experiment one. Um, Again, people produce more monofungal eye when they're exposed to this southern accented talker, even though this talker never produced any instances of the eye vowel. So um, we essentially replicated experiment one. And um, I'll just note that, that this result replicates not just from experiment one to experiment two in this paper, um, but we've also looked at this um, uh, with a more recent study this past year, um, as well as some other replications that um, change quite a bit more about the experiment. Um, but we can be pretty confident, I think, that this is a reliable linguistic behavior that we're able to elicit with this word naming game. Okay, so uh, let's see if our dialect background effect replicates as well. Uh, so here, when we break down our results um, by non-Southerners in the top and Southerners in the bottom, um, again, we see that this effect is primarily driven by Southerners. So Southerners converge more. Okay, so I'll um, move on to talk about some individual differences now that we've looked at um, sort of aggregate behaviors and saw that experiment two replicates experiment one. Um, now we can ask what are our individual participants doing? Uh, okay, so this graph shows how each uh, individual speaker shifts from their baseline to the exposure phase. So we have um, non-Southerners on the left and Southerners on the right and um, each line represents a speaker. So um, people who uh, converge or become more monoclonal, they are um, represented by green lines and divergers or people who shift in the opposite direction are these orange lines. 
so one thing we can see when we look at individual behaviors is um, we, we can sort of see why Southerners converged uh, more in the aggregate. And, um, and I think the answer is it's not really that Southerners show bigger shifts necessarily, uh, but, but it's simply the case that, that more Southerners converge compared to non-Southerners. So uh, roughly 82% of Southerners converge, um, and there, uh, there are only five divergers among our Southerners, but only 68% of non-Southerners converge. Um, so the Southern group just contains more convergers. But they don't actually exhibit much bigger shifts on average. Just looking at convergers, the two groups show uh, similar sized shifts. Southerners are just more likely to shift. And even though Southerners as a group are more likely to shift, uh, it's also the case that the most uh, glide weakened or Southern sounding participants to begin with um, actually um, uh, shift less or diverge. Uh, so four out of five of our Southern divergers highlighted in this um, orange box, they, um, they started off the experiment already more glide weakened than any of the non-Southerners. Um, so the people who, who end up diverging, they were already Southern shifted. They don't shift more. They possibly can't shift more. And uh, our statistical modeling also shows that uh, baseline productions predict degree of shift. So uh, people who start off the experiment sounding uh, the least Southern-like, uh, these are the people that produce, um, uh, th that uh, shift the most, they converge the most. And this makes sense uh, because um, as I mentioned, sort of people who produce already weakened eye glides um, presumably wouldn't be able to or wouldn't need to um, shift much to match what they expect from the model talker. So we have these two findings that uh, maybe appear almost contradictory at first glance. Um, Southerners are more likely to shift, but also people with less Southern-like productions to begin with uh, are more likely to shift. But this is actually consistent with previous findings um, on convergence showing that speakers shift toward uh, the most salient and distant targets that um, are also within their own speech repertoire. So there's, there seems to be this sort of happy medium about what people can target in convergence. So uh, dialect background is a major predictor of convergence as we've seen. Uh, but even within each dialect group, we see that some people converge more than others. So why do we see these differences across individuals? Uh, this is where we get into our survey measures. So uh, one thing we might speculate is that positive attitudes, either toward the model talker or toward the Southern dialect, uh, might facilitate convergence. And past work has shown this, right, that, that more positive attitudes toward a talker lead to more convergence. So uh, people converge more toward talkers that they rated as more attractive. People converge more toward uh, language varieties that they have more positive feelings about. And people converge more when the talker that they're listening to tells a story with a positive outcome as opposed to a negative one. So liking a talker or feeling positively toward them or their speech uh, really seems to facilitate convergence. Uh, of course, we might also predict that uh, people converge more toward features or dialects that they are most familiar with. Um, and we can imagine that this would be especially important for expectation-driven shifts because people have to uh, sort of call up their production target from memory rather than just observing it in the moment. Uh, so, so next we're going to look at whether these self-reported attitudes and familiarity measures, um, whether these influence convergence rates.
Okay, so we're basically going to look at a bunch of correlations between our survey measures and degree of shift. Um, so I'm measuring um, shift, degree of shift from the baseline to exposure as um, uh, random effects extracted from our model um, for the exposure phase compared to the baseline phase. Um, so essentially controlling for all of the stuff that we put into the model, what individual differences still remain. Uh, and since I'm doing a bunch of correlations here, um, uh, multiple comparisons correction was done with uh, permutation tests. So we see that um, perceived prestige and uh, talker likability don't really correlate with convergence. These are pretty flat lines, right? Uh, neither does a general attitude toward the South. And even familiarity with the South doesn't predict convergence behaviors. We see that Southerners have higher scores. Southerners are obviously more familiar with the South. Um, but um, familiarity also doesn't seem to predict um, uh, convergence rates. So uh, none of our attitudes uh, or familiarity measures predict convergence. Um, this is somewhat surprising since there, there's a good amount of literature suggesting that positive attitudes do facilitate convergence and, and we'll talk in the discussion about why this might be. Um, but we've also got a lot more survey measures to look at. So let's jump into those. Okay, so I'll, I'll take a minute here to talk about what other studies have found about how personality or cognitive style might correlate with convergence. And there, there are sort of two main findings that pop up again and again in the literature. Um, and these are, first of all, greater desire for social approval um, seems to facilitate convergence and so does um, a greater focus on um, the stimuli or the experimental materials. Um, and we see this with a couple of different measures. So the Marlowe Crown uh, Social Desirability Scale measures how much someone um, misrepresents themselves to be perceived in a, in, a, in a more socially desirable way. And this has been shown to predict um, greater convergence. And this makes sense if we think that um, you know, converging toward our um, interlocutor will make them like us more and that will be perceived in, um, in a more positive way. And the uh, neuroticism personality trait on the big five inventory has also been found uh, to predict more convergence. And, um, and pe people sort of suggest that this is because higher neuroticism indicates more uh, worry about how you're perceived. So it's sort of considered to, to um, uh, indicate a need for, for social approval as well. And um, a related measure that I, that I don't look at today is sensitivity to social rejection, um, which has also been shown to predict more convergence. Um, so we see quite a few um, measures of social approval have been um, correlated with greater convergence in previous studies. Uh, another finding is that more um, focus on the stimuli or, or sort of engagement with the um, materials uh, in the experiment, that this facilitates convergence too. So um, people have looked at the attention switching subscore of the AQ. Uh, which measures the tendency to sort of um, stay focused on one thing and, and avoid uh, switching attention back and forth. And this has been shown to positively correlate with convergence. And the openness personality trait on the big five uh, has also been shown to correlate with convergence. And people suggest that this is for the same reason, greater openness um, uh, means greater uh, engagement with the stimuli in an experiment. Okay, so let's see uh, whether we replicate any of these previous findings. Uh, so one, one prediction that we might have going into this, or one prediction that I had going into this, is that um, with expectation-driven convergence in particular, uh, we might predict that social approval 
would matter more than focus on stimuli since people aren't actually observing the stimuli that they're converging toward in the moment. Um, so social approval might matter, matter more, but um, we'll see if that's the case. Okay, so the attention switching subscore and the openness score were the two that previously um, were shown to, to correlate with convergence. Uh, but we really see no relationship here um, for both Southerners and non-Southerners, um, the relationship between these measures and um, degree of convergence, um, uh, we, we see no significant relationship. The only significant factor that uh, relates to focus or attention was this attention to detail subscore of the AQ. Uh, but this effect was actually in the opposite direction of what we'd expect. So higher attention to detail scores um, predict less convergence. Um, so this is, is not what we expected and not in line with previous uh, findings. So we can, we can pretty clearly say that we don't find any evidence that um, greater attention or focus on these measures um, actually predicts convergence. Okay, moving on to our social approval measures. Um, we also don't replicate previous findings that higher Marlowe Crown social desirability scores predict greater convergence either. Um, there is a slight uh, but not significant trend in the expected direction, but this is just for non-Southerners. And for um, the neuroticism score of the big five, um, again, we see the opposite effect of what we'd expect uh, for non-Southerners. So lower scores um, are what predicts more convergence here. So again, we don't replicate any of the previous findings. Um, if anything, we find um, evidence in the opposite direction. Um, so just one last thing that we'll look at, the only other measure that significantly correlated with degree of shift uh, that might have anything to do with social approval is this uh, conscientiousness personality trait on the, um, the big five. Um, so this sort of makes sense because conscientiousness is related to social desirability and neuroticism. Um, it measures things like competence and duty, uh, self-discipline. Uh, which you know are socially desirable traits and, and sort of shares characteristics with um, some of the measures on the social desirability scale. But we actually see the same sort of correlation, even slightly bigger for um, Southerners and the control condition. So when they hear the Midland accented talker, uh, they do the same thing. So this tells us that it's not really predicting a uh, degree of convergence, but more something like degree of reduction as the experiment progresses. Um, and so I bring up this point um, because I think it's important that if, if we're going to be looking at individual differences um, and how they predict convergence, um, I think it's important that we you know, check whether our measures are actually predicting degree of convergence or if they're picking up on other types of shifts uh, in speech, like, like a tendency to um, reduce speech more over time. Um, so I think um, it's useful to use a control condition like I do here um, when looking at the role of individual differences in convergence so that we can um, sort of tease apart these, these potential influences. Okay, so even with all of the surveys that we gave to participants measuring all of these different attitudes or traits, none of these seem to predict convergence. Um, so we'll wrap up here with the results and we'll move on to the discussion and talk about um, why a little bit in a second. Okay, so what do we learn? What do we take away from this line of work? Um, to start from sort of a narrower perspective, we learned some things about this new phenomenon, expectation-driven convergence uh, in particular. So expectation-driven convergence occurs. Um, it's something that we can empirically observe and we can elicit it in the lab. And uh, our this new uh, word naming game paradigm does a pretty good job of eliciting it. 
Um, so this shows us that expectations influence uh, not just processing, but production too. Uh, we have a lot of evidence on the role of expectation and prediction in speech processing and in lexical access. Um, but we know, I think, much less about the role of expectations, especially sociolinguistic expectations in production. So um, the fact that we uh, see expectation-driven convergence, um, uh, this suggests that uh, expectations might account for some of the variation that we see in production too. Uh, and finally, we learn that uh, expectations for one variant can be cued by observing other variants. Um, so people who um, heard some features of Southern speech um, were cued to converge in this other aspect of Southern speech. And this suggests, I think, that people have mental links between um, what I'll call sociolinguistically related variants. Uh, and I'll have more to say about that in just a second. But let's talk about um, sort of what else we've learned. Um, we learned some things about individual differences. Uh, we didn't find any reliable predictors of expectation-driven convergence among any of our measures, attitudes, personality, cognitive style. Um, and the one promising correlation we did find uh, didn't actually predict convergence. It really predicted uh, general shifts across the experiment. So um, again, I think this highlights the need to include things like control conditions in these types of studies on individual differences. Uh, okay, so, so why the lack of correlation? Um, I think there are a few possibilities that we can speculate about. Uh, it might have something to do with the fact that we're looking at expectation-driven convergence, not input-driven convergence. So maybe we failed to replicate previous findings because these are simply two different phenomena that use different mechanisms. Um, with regard to the um, attitude predictors in particular, um, one thing I would do on, on future follow-ups maybe um, of this work is to look at implicit attitudes rather than asking about attitudes explicitly. So I think, um, you know, one possibility is that people weren't willing to rate the talker or the dialect too negatively, which could impact the role of attitudes on convergence behaviors. Uh, but I'll just follow up here by saying that I think uh, what these results suggest is that we need you know, more studies, more work, testing how individual differences studies replicate in different scenarios, different types of convergence and different experimental paradigms to different features. Um, and so by continuing to do this work, I think this will give us, um, you know, a fuller picture of what individual differences um, uh, facilitate convergence. Um, and finally, we did discover two things about who is converging more and why. Um, so we saw that people who are from the South converged more toward the Southern talker, um, but so do people who have less Southern-like baselines to begin with. Um, and this is really neat, I think, because it falls in line with um, this previous work on convergence showing that people converge toward the most noticeable differences as long as um, they're within their own repertoires. Okay, um, so what can we say about convergence more generally and about the mechanisms uh, behind convergence? Why do people converge? Um, so I'll take a step back here for a minute and um, just quickly talk about some previous explanations for linguistic convergence. Um, so, so sort of broadly speaking, there are, there are two um, main approaches to explaining linguistic convergence and, um, and when we're talking about these people are usually talking about input driven convergence or convergence to observations. Um, so we have the automatic sort of mechanistic account and the um, social psychological account. And uh, the automatic account says that convergence stems from um, automatic behaviors, things like activation of exemplars and episodic memory, where what we 
perceive, um, activates sort of similar stored utterances that influence our own production targets. Um, another idea is that convergence um, might be a natural result of comprehension if comprehension involves production processes. So, um, you know, for instance, perception uh, occurring in terms of motor gestures um, in theories like motor theory or direct realism. And um, so these types of explanations tend to rely on production targets that are derived directly from the immediate input. And um, they really only ever look at input-driven convergence. And so um, uh, in this paper, one thing I argue is that these automatic accounts of convergence can't really, at least straightforwardly, account for expectation-driven convergence, since we know that people can converge towards something that's not in the input. Um, other people take the approach that convergence stems from primarily social or psychological motivations. So uh, Bell's audience design model, for instance, um, considers convergence to be a form of uh, style shifting in response to um, an addressee. Uh, communication accommodation theory suggests that uh, convergence is a tool that people use to manage social distance between ourselves and others. Um, so, so rather than thinking of these as sort of um, opposite approaches um, where one's right, uh, in the paper I consider how we might integrate automatic and social accounts in ways that align with our empirical observations in these experiments. Uh, so I can imagine this working in two ways. Um, for one, we can imagine that social motivations might be involved if they facilitate or inhibit any automatic processes. So, um, you know, many of my participants uh, in these experiments, um, they mentioned sort of catching themselves, putting on a Southern accent, and they, they said they purposely stopped themselves once they became aware of it. Um, people might also converge beyond what we'd see from automatic shifts if they have social reasons for doing so. Uh, but, but for the most part, people didn't seem to be aware that they were converging in these experiments. Um, and if they were, they, they didn't seem to be doing it intentionally. Um, so if, if expectation-driven convergence stems from automatic shifts or unintentional processes, uh, I think this means that they they must draw from social knowledge, and that means that social knowledge must be a crucial part of um, of expectation driven convergence. It's the only way to get from uh, you know what people observe in this experiment to what they end up producing. Um, so since since hearing some southern accented variants leads to uh, production of a completely different variant, people must be uh, drawing from mental associations between what they observe and what they go on to produce. So they have to have some sort of connection, some sort of associations um, between these different related variants. Um, so I just wanna talk for the next couple of minutes about what this might look like. Um, so in the paper, I suggest that there are at least two possible ways that um, different related variants might be associatively linked in the minds of speakers. Uh, the first is what I call an indirect route or a route that's um, mediated by the social category. So hearing all of these Southern accented variants would activate the concept of Southernness, which in turn would activate um, representations of monoplungal I because monofungal eye is very closely and stereotypically associated with Southern speech. Uh, so the idea here is that the actually observed variants and monofungal eye are um, associated via their shared social category label, but not directly. But another possibility is a more direct route between observed variants and monofungal I, where the social category uh, isn't necessarily activated. 
So the idea is that exposure to all of these southern accented variants could activate monophthongal eye directly uh, because they commonly co-occur in individual southerner speech. And so what this would mean is that people make use um, of direct links between variants that co-occur often in the speech of many different individuals. Um, and, and of course, this still requires a type of social knowledge about who is using what combinations of features. Um, so I can't say much about what's the right approach here, um, but I do tease these explanations apart in a paper that is currently in preparation. Um, but for now, I'll just say that, uh, you know, regardless of what types of associations are responsible, expectation-driven convergence tells us that social knowledge is a crucial component of what we know about language, and it influences our speech accordingly. So uh, finally, moving forward, I, you know, I view this work as an important step toward, um, first of all, refining our cognitive models to account for variation and sociolinguistic knowledge. Um, but I think it also opens up a world of other questions. Um, so we've laid some groundwork suggesting that people um, might represent language beyond isolated variants, things like individual systems or entire speech styles. And there's probably a lot more to say about this in future work as well. Uh, of course, we also probably wonder about the role of expectations with different variants and different social categories. Um, so we looked at monophthongal I in Southern speech because it's a stereotypical feature and a variety that's, that's pretty well recognized. Um, but we might wonder at this point um, about the role of expectations with less salient linguistic features or social categories. Um, and finally, We've uh, seen that dialect background or past experience plays a role in these behaviors. Um, you know, Southerners converge more. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting questions um, moving forward that we could ask about how our sociolinguistic knowledge changes over time as we, as we get new experiences and uh, how this might come to be reflected in the way we speak. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to jump into the questions now. Um, thank you guys for attending and, and for um, yeah for coming to this talk. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the questions um, section. Um, I'll just go through the one I see says, "Is there a live transcript?" Um, oh, is this about the the talk itself or about the um, materials. I will say that um, all of the materials for this experiment are available on my GitHub. So if anybody wants to um, follow up on this experiment, um, the materials for the experimental design as well as the data are available there. Oh, here's one. Um, Um, I'll read this question. It says, I'm a New York transplant in DC and have noticed that my New York accent gets thicker when talking to working class individuals in DC, even though their accents are more likely um, Tidewater, AAV, or Southern. Did your research show convergence in ways other than um, phonological, such as expected register or socioeconomic um, level? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that that example um, really falls in, that, in line nicely with the, um, the results of this experiment showing that our expectations um, about others, even if they're, they're not exactly accurate or are based on stereotypes or are based on these sort of associations that we might have that don't necessarily reflect the actual state of the world, um, that all of these things can influence our speech and our convergence behaviors. Um, so I think this is very much an example, you know, even if um, these um, uh, you're, you're converging in ways that aren't, you know, necessarily accurate to what um, these people would be doing uh, with their speech, you're converging in ways that reflect your associations possibly. 
um, yeah, so I think this aligns nicely with um, what we see about expectation-driven convergence here. I don't see any other. Oh, it looks like here's one. Okay, um, seems like to distinguish between direct and indirect route, uh, routes, you'd need to pick a variable that is still below the level of general social consciousness, um, i.e. Lebovian indicators and markers, not stereotypes. Look forward to reading the follow-up paper. Yeah, so um, I know that wasn't necessarily a question, um, but I, I can just follow up on that and say that um, what I do end up doing in this follow-up paper, if anybody's interested, is um, essentially separate what people are told about the, the, the social category that a talker belongs to and um, what they actually hear from the talker to see if um, people are paying attention to the um, sort of phonetic features um, versus the social category that they're given. Um, and what I find and that I think is really interesting is that um, Southerners and non-Southerners actually pay attention to different information um, where non-Southerners focus on um, the, the accent features that they actually hear, Southerners do, and um, non-Southerners pay more attention to the social uh, dialect label that they're given. Um, uh, yeah, which I think is really interesting. So um, um, I look forward to, to having that work out soon. Um, next question. Uh, these are so tiny. Um, what role would social stigma play in expectation-driven convergence toward a feature? Would people not converge towards, say, a feature of L2-accented English or diverge from it? Or take the case of Southerners with I'm on organization who diverged after hearing the Southern speaker? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think one thing, this sort of plays into um, the point I brought up about sort of integrating the automatic and social um, explanations for convergence. Um, so I think one thing we might expect is um, these sort of automatic influences over our own speech, but um, for particularly um, stigmatized features, I would expect people to, um, you know, become aware of any sort of automatic shifts that are influencing their speech and be more likely to inhibit those behaviors, recognize that they're doing that and, um, you know, uh, sort of purposely stop themselves from trying to converge in those situations, especially where it might be perceived as, um, you know, mocking or, or, or not done with good intentions. Um, as far as the Southerners who um, started off the experiment with already monophthongal I and then they diverged after hearing the Southern talker. Um, yeah, I mean, that could have something to do with um, stigma. What I think it probably has more to do with is um, sort of attempts at um, contrast maintenance or contrast preservation where, um, you know, they might catch themselves. Um, making these automatic shifts toward more monophthongal pronunciations and realize that that is, um, you know, making their I category become um, closer to, say, ah, for instance, and, um, uh, you know, in an attempt to maintain the, the contrast between those two phonemes, they, um, you know, when they catch themselves doing this, they, that might result in divergence, I think. Uh, but thanks, good question. All right, there's a couple more I'll read through. I'm just gonna go through in order. Um, curious about the role of race since some black participants may have had eye monophthongization as a result. Um, they, yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, were participants a majority white? If so, would having a larger sample size of black participants perhaps result in race-based variation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, looking at the differences between um, you know, white and black speakers, for instance, wasn't the primary focus here. They were primarily um, white, all of the participants um, in the study. And, um, uh, but I will say that um, um, I did look at um, race sort of after the fact, and it didn't um, look like um, black speakers were um, 
you know, patterning with Southerners necessarily um, in, in, the, in that they were converging more um, in any sort of noticeable way, but the sample size was so small that it would be um, difficult to tell for sure. Um, okay, next question says, um, very interesting work for your work exploring um, uh, psychosociological features like personality features, autism spectrum, Southern attitude ratings. I was curious how long generally it took for your participants to do this experiment, especially with a relatively straightforward experiment for listening um, pronunciations. Um, yeah, so the experiment was quite long. It took participants about an hour, um, a little over an hour with all of the survey measures added. Um, when I did switch from experiment one to experiment two to um, to add these survey measures, um, I had to shorten the clues. So I cut down the clues by about half so that it wouldn't take so long to listen to or read the clues because it was, it was getting to be quite long for participants. But it, it did take them about an hour to get through, which seemed to be doable for um, for most participants, but you know, some complained. <laughs> oh, um, so here's another question. In one of your earlier sets of graphs, I was puzzled by a drastic difference in the baseline across the two groups. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, this was an experiment one, and um, what we saw was that um, we, uh, among our Southern participants, we happened to have um, a lot more already Southern shifted or monoclonal people in the Midland condition that were randomly assigned to the Midland condition compared to the um, Southern condition. Um, this baseline difference wasn't something that um, you know, came up again in experiment two, it did really seem to be that it just happened to be that we had more already Southern shifted participants in that group. Um, but yeah, that, that's exactly, that, that was one of the main reasons why I wanted to follow up and replicate this with um, experiment two, um, was to see if that baseline difference really played a big role in um, observing expectation driven convergence in the first place. Um, but it did appear that even without that baseline difference, we still see, um, you know, very similar results across the two experiments. Um, I think that's all of the questions I see. If I'm missing any, um, you know, feel free to, free to post right under. Um, And apologies if I'm missing any questions. Yeah, feel free to repost if I if I happen to not see any other questions that are there. If there aren't any questions, we can always wrap up a little early, unless you have some closing comments you'd like to make. Um, there's actually, well, one other uh, comment from Dr. Chang. Uh, thank you for designing such a cool experimental paradigm. Uh, well, thanks. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess I'll just wrap up um, by saying that, um, you know, like I said, um, the experimental design and the data for this is available if anybody wants to sort of, um, you know, follow up. I think it would be great to see um, what other ways people are converging toward expectations to other varieties, to other features. So I'd love to see um, other, other sorts of work come out of this uh, sort of paradigm. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wade, for this fascinating presentation. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, a version of this uh, webinar will be made available on the LSA's YouTube channel later today or over the weekend. And you should receive a follow-up email from us as well. So thank you once again. Once we end the seminar, this will abruptly kick you out of the application. So just it's brace for that technological rudeness. But thanks again, um, and we look forward to seeing you all at the, uh, at the next webinar. Thanks so much.